All right, I think we'll get started. Thanks to everyone who showed up today. I know it's the second round or the first round of the NC2A tournament, so you all opted to come here first instead of watching a basketball game. So Obviously. thank you very much. <laughs> Obviously, you're not basketball fans. <laughs> uh, it's great to see so many new faces in the gallery and, and old faces as well. Uh, and welcome to Studio Kroner, and thanks to Kevin for uh, being here and showcasing his uh, beautiful body of work. It uh, feels like a real honor to have artwork of this quality hanging on the walls here, so thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Uh, just, so I got to meet Kevin a couple years ago. Uh, he's the professor of a, a young woman who showed here, um, Devin Horton, this was your pupil, and you showed up and I got to meet you and she mm -hmm. just raved about you. And, uh, and then I got to know your work online and then I invited myself to your studio last year. <laughs> yeah, well no, it was good having you <laughs> and, uh, and I, and I uh, was sort of blown away uh, by your work and your technique and your process. Um, I'm a, a, by trade, I'm a graphic designer and one of the things that really attracts me to your work is you, you're an incredible designer as well as a painter. And, and I love seeing that combination happening in artwork. That always excites me. And, uh, and, it, and, and I know you reference a lot of really good designers like Caravaggio and Homer and yeah, Robert yeah. and everybody like that who are excellent designers as well. And I'm always intrigued by the idea of the design entering into the art world. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, it's, I don't think it's talked enough about. Mm -hmm. uh, and even within abstract world, you, you get mm -hmm. that kind of work. But before we go down there, um, I just want for you to introduce yourself All right. to the audience. Talk a little bit about how you got here, your journey to get to Northern Kentucky. Okay. Uh, love to hear a little bit about your childhood okay. and, uh, and your initial forays into art. All right. Uh, and also your sort of relationship to nature, having grown up in Wisconsin and how that's translated into your artwork and into your present. That's a lot of questions to answer. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. um, it's great seeing so many friendly faces today. I'm so excited that you guys are here. As you know, my name's Kevin Minty. Um, I've been doing, I've been painting since high school, and I went to undergraduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and then also went to graduate school at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I was maybe a little interested in art growing up. I was more interested in becoming a Native American. And <laughs> as funny as that sounds, I think that, that sort of direction really steered me to landscape painting. Growing up in Wisconsin, my parents would take us camping and I was constantly roaming the woods, walking around the rivers and lakes there, and I found that I had a real connection to nature, just like the Native Americans. In high school, I wanted to be an architect, and the, I had an architecture class my junior year, but we did really sort of nuts and bolts architecture, so I was thinking more about conceptual architecture, maybe like Frank Gehry, if you've seen some of his buildings, those types of like really creative designs, thinking about how light might affect someone in a space and just um, like a space itself. And we didn't, we didn't do any of that. We did sort of like, we're gonna build a you know, 50s suburban house and you need to know how big the door jams are and that like bored me and I had a couple of electives to take my senior year and I decided to take an art class. My high school art teacher, Mr. Javavi, uh, just got people really excited about art. I'm so glad that I took a drawing and painting class with him and there was also sort of a component of design uh, at that time it was like commercial art and so I remember like dealing with like oh I'm gonna make a cover for a thrasher magazine I'm also really into skateboarding so I remember like drawing uh, the skateboarder and trying to like 
pretend like I was going to be designing my own cover for Thrasher magazine. That has not happened. Anyway, um, uh, but, but like people that were under his tutelage for more than just their senior year like I was, they were getting full rides to the Art Institute of Chicago, to Pratt, all, all of these great places. And so I just felt really fortunate just to actually have a class or two with him. Uh, and that kind of started my art career going into college. I thought I was going to be a graphic designer, but I really liked my painting and drawing classes more and just kind of kept pursuing that. And my uh, senior year, I was in an advanced painting class and I was dabbling with surrealism and I, I felt like I was kind of in a rut a little bit. My friends and I, we went to the Art Institute of Chicago and we were looking at impressionist artwork and I was really excited about how they were painting light, capturing light. And we decided to, after we came back from, like during, after spring break, we came back and we decided the three of us were gonna go landscape painting in Wisconsin in spring. None of us were prepa prepared. I didn't even have an easel. I was just sitting on my paint box with my painting on my lap. We were all freezing and it was a cold, cloudy, windy day. And I was like, I don't know about this. And all of a sudden the sun came out, the clouds parted and we were just painting this, just this like cornfield that was had been tilled and you know it was in the spring and like I just loved seeing the golden lines happen from some of the the furrows of all of the corn rows and I was like I was hooked I was like oh my goodness like I know what Van Gogh is talking about when he talks about like why do you paint because of the sun and it was like wow I was like so excited so captivated and so for years I painted landscape um and I think that also had something to do with being tied to um, Wisconsin or being in these like wild places and trying to just feel like I was like discovering it myself. And if you, for years, my landscapes did not have people in them. I thought that the person that would be in them would be the viewer looking at the landscape itself. And eventually, I started making landscapes that had these sculptural frames and I would have little niches in them that I would sometimes put found objects that were in the landscape where I was painting, trying to almost continue a story, making a longer narrative with the landscape. And at a certain point, I decided to put myself into a painting with my dog after she just hurt her back. There was also a life incident where my wife Tammy rescued this little bird and then I'm like, I wanna make a painting of that. And so all of a sudden, people started to inhabit my landscapes. And then I thought I could tell stories and that really got me interested again in like another investment into my painting like ooh, I can tell this story I can tell this story and so that's kind of how I don't you guys want to hear more um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, that's it uh, like I guess well, like why am I here today um, after after I graduated from college I was working uh, 33 hours in three days uh, like that was my work week I would uh, I was working at a aquarium store, Aquatics Unlimited. It was like the best fish store. Uh, people would actually, like some school groups would come and I would teach them about fish because it was almost like a, it's nothing like Newport Aquarium, but, but it's like, uh, it was like a really great fish store to work at. And I was working 33 hours a week there and then the rest of the time, uh, it freed me up to paint in my studio, which was just a little room that was also our kitchen at the time. And 
I ended up getting this thing called Mycobacterium marinum, which you've probably never heard of unless anyone is a disease infection, infectious disease specialist. But anyway, it causes tuberculosis in fish. And I got it. I have these big long scars on my arm because the fish had this disease. One of the tanks I was cleaning that week um, had it and I caught it and it's not, not a good thing to get, but I decided I can't work at the fish store anymore. And I got a job working for a muralist, which was also, so I worked for a muralist, Tim Haglin Mural Designs for a year. He was really tough and really like upped my game because he was such a perfectionist and he was so specific in his demands and wants. And at first I was just like, man, I can't handle this. Like he's always on me because I'm not doing this right or not doing this right. And it felt very much like this like master apprentice relationship, but I learned so much from him. And one day I remember we had done this faux finish work and we were doing mural work and I was scraping paint, which is one of my least favorite things to do. And I was scraping paint off of some wood woodwork because we had gotten a little bit too excited in our uh, painting and I was just like, I'm going to grad school. And so that day, <laughs> that day I like, I think it was like, I don't know, like probably like December and like graduate schools start accepting applications in January or February. And I was just like, and we didn't have, I, the internet was in its like infancy, infancy. So like, I remember like just pulling, going to the library, pulling out this book about graduate schools. And I remember I saw the University of Cincinnati and I was like, oh, they have a good basketball team. That was the first thing. <laughs> and then the second thing was, oh, their deadline is until March. And, and I applied to a few schools and got into a couple. And then I came to the University of Cincinnati for uh, graduate school because the art museum was so good, because the art scene here was so vibrant. There were lots of galleries. And then the Taft Museum of Art, where my wife works now, was really inspirational for me. At the time, I was super involved with Barbizon school painting. And there's a couple of French painters, Camille Corot and Francois uh, Daubigny. And those guys were like my heroes. And like the Taft Museum has some really great paintings of, of theirs plus others and other Barbizon painters. And I was just like, when I'm not learning from my professors at school, I can learn from the professors of the past, all of these painters from the past. So now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> That was a great introduction. I'm Maybe that was too much. No, no, it's excellent. Right. Uh, so you've been teaching at NKU for 23 years, I believe? Yeah, I started in uh, uh, 2001. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, was that a surprise to go into teaching? Were you like expecting to do that, thinking about mm -hmm. doing that? How did that transpire? No, um, I think I've always been a teacher. When I worked at the fish store aquatics unlimited when they would schedule school like school groups would come to our our shop and who was going to be the person that was going to teach them about fish it was me it's like and then like i'm trying to teach other people that know so much more about fish than i did at the time and like each week i would do a fish of the week so i'd do a drawing of the fish and then like give all these statistics about it like and so like, I just like to give back. Mm. And then I also, while I was in Milwaukee, I taught at the Milwaukee Art Museum and I don't know exactly what qualifications I had to be teaching at the Milwaukee Art Museum. So I was teaching little kids that were like five years old at art camp, showing them how to use charcoal, maybe not the right way because some of them looked like they were working in the mines all day after just 15 <laughs> minutes. But, um, but like, you know, I just get super stoked when I can share some of my knowledge with someone and I see them pick that up. And even today um, at the skate park, 
there was someone that I was able to show a couple of things and that really got me excited because here someone is struggling with something. I can say, why don't you try this or try this, maybe do it this way. And all of a sudden you see them learn something and like I feed off of that. I really get excited when I see people learning and I think we should all try to teach each other things. How does the teaching at the college level, how does that inform your own process of painting and the work you're doing today? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I feel in some ways I'm trying to give them the knowledge that I have, my, my students. Some of them, uh, the things I've been talking about, the artists that I mentioned, they're not that familiar with. And I feel like I need to know some of the artist or the anime people that they like and I I'm trying to like bridge that gap a little bit uh, but at the same time I'm like maybe they should learn the people that I want them to know about you know um, so so there's that but I also just when students are learning and when they have their uh, BFA shows and they thank you for what they've learned I mean that's really moving yeah. it's a special thing yeah Mm -hmm. Most obvious uh, at the opening the other night, you had so many oh. former students here that uh, you're, you're greatly mm -hmm. admired by them. So that Thanks. was really cool to yeah. see that. Uh, There's a couple in the back right now, former students. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're the models. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the I'm intrigued by you know you're sharing them your knowledge of. Uh, are these artists from the past, but you're also learning about the new contemporary artists and art forms maybe that you're not as interested in. But mm -hmm. how does that creep into your work? Like, who have you learned about that you're like, oh man, that, I, I can learn a new move from that, that person. Oh, I don't know if they've given me any that have like excited me, but I mean, I'm always looking at contemporary artists. There's artists like uh, Bo Bartlett um, and Carl, Dobsky, who are both narrative artists, and I'm always kind of like, my narratives are starting to get more complex, so uh, it's like I kind of think I need to do what I'm telling the students to do. So if I'm trying to further my work, I better be doing the things that I'm telling them to do as well. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, you know, we, you and I have talked about the, the sort of cinematic nature of your work, and you've written about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's very obvious, you know, all these pieces feel like they're something's just happened or something's just about to happen. And there's that tension in between that really involves us mm -hmm. as the viewers, like, you know, you're sort of on edge trying to figure out what's going to happen, but it feels like a, you know, a scene in a sequence of scenes. Um, are you a, a big movie buff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am. And so I, I borrow or steal ideas from just about anywhere. Uh, like I look at photographers like Gregory Crutzen and in terms of film, uh, it might be a really pop culture film, it might be something that's a little bit more artsy, but I'm always looking um, at, at things. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's uh, any paintings right here that, um, I mean, uh, you might have seen like the movie uh, Platoon or uh, maybe you've watched Band of Brothers. This is from um, the Vietnam War, but like, uh, and then there's this one, which is from the Korean War, this one called Patrol. And to get the answers that I'm looking for at times, like I start watching these TV shows like Band of Brothers or the Pacific and in the case of the painting that's called Patrol and it's dark, I'm using the figures from the, on the National Monument uh, for the Korean War Memorial. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of concrete slash bronzy and I'm trying to make them look real. And the whole painting started and I was trying to, I, I took the photos on kind of a day like today 
and then I'm trying to make it a rainy day and I'm like, I don't know anything about like this. And then I start to make it dark and night. And one of my uh, friends, his daughters are strewn about in tons of these paintings. Uh, he's, his name's uh, Francois Leroy. He's a World War II historian. He's like, well, you need to check out the Iwo Jima um, Pacific uh, from the, the TV show The Pacific. You need to check out the, the episode Iwo Jima. It, it's almost all at night in the rain. The guy, guys are wearing ponchos. And so I'm like, okay. And so um, there's, there's, not, there's not much stalking that's going on in, in the patrol. I mean, it's lots of fire all the time, but like just watching that and seeing how um, the director really like makes it dark and it's hard to see things, which makes you kind of like look a little bit harder. Uh, I, I pulled that from that, from that, but I'm always like looking at movies, watching movies and I'll see a, like you guys know Star Wars, right? Um, if we had a, if I was giving a slide presentation, I have this image of Luke Skywalker looking at the two uh, suns setting and I steal that pose all of the time because when you're behind Luke Skywalker or if you're behind the person in the painting, you start to take on or start to think about some of the same things that that person is thinking about. And so I'm always looking at film, looking at photographs and looking at paintings to help give me ideas for my compositions and for just furthering some of the action that could happen in my paintings. Yeah. Well, they're all such deliberate uh, compositions, and I know you brought some visual aids here, and I'm okay. wondering if maybe you yeah. can talk yeah. about through some of those just to show your process, because okay. I know you're a yeah. process-oriented yeah. painter. There's a couple of different ways that I paint. In some cases, it starts with an idea, after the idea, I might sketch a few things down in my sketchbook. I then usually make almost like a storyboard with lots of images, paintings, photos. Some of them aren't, aren't even, they're just like photos from CNN or something. Also some film stills and I show those to my models and I'm like, I wanna do a scene like this, I wanna do a scene like this, I wanna do a scene like this. I might take sometimes anywhere from 200 to 400 photos and from that batch I call through them and I usually figure out it's almost like American Idol like only one or two of these will be what the painting will be and so um, once I've decided that I print out the photograph I grid the photograph and then I grid my canvas to the same aspect ratio so I know exactly where something is and then I paint it. That's one way I go about it. I also have extensively painted landscapes from life and from direct observation. I also draw the figure model um, on a weekly basis to kind of keep up my powers of observation from direct observation. And then in the past couple of years, I've been doing uh, like little drawings like this. You guys can pass this around. This is the drawing for this painting here. And then once I have the drawing done, I take it to Kinko's FedEx and I use their architectural blueprint uh, printers and I can print it really large. And so I've brought, um, This is the printout for. Do you want to hold that side there? Um, this is the printout for Dogs of War, and then I have a piece of paper that has pastel on the back. I tape this to the canvas, and then I trace over this. You can see that there's pen marks uh, all through this. And then it transfers this to the canvas. And then I paint it from there. And in some ways, this allows me or affords me, what's the one? Uh, let's see. 
Oh yeah, here's, I don't know, maybe I got two of them here. And you can see I even gridded my drawing just a little bit. And then, uh, so this one's, uh, um, you know, it's, I had two or three images that I took the Kinkos and printed out a couple of copies of it and then mm -hmm. transferred mm -hmm. it. So. so, I mean, I, you know, it's, we were talking about this with Tammy the other day, this particular piece and just all the, the little design decisions that are happening here in terms of uh, all these, the way this all works yeah. around and where the angles are leading you to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just that kind of stuff excites me and I'd love to just talk about that a little okay. bit have you talk about your thoughts behind that yeah right let's set this down yeah so there's um and this is the dogs of war painting that's uh in the front but uh in photoshop I was kind of playing with design and like I'll put a dog here what way is that dog looking and then that obviously we find we follow the gaze of the dog and that kind of leads us through or the body positioning of one dog to another starts to take us through. And then in some instances, I play around a little bit with the water or the water reflections to extend something a little bit further. And then that connects the eye and lets the eye sort of ride through the rest of the, the composition. So there's some elements of painting that are slightly invented, like I'm going to just do this extra rock here, or I'm going to uh, make this wave just a little bit further. And then that like, like visually hooks in from one thing to another and leads the eye around. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. And then it's kind of funny that uh, one of the dogs, like there's a Caravaggio painting in Rome where uh, there it's, uh, I think it's the um, calling of St. Peter uh, or, Saul becoming uh, Peter, and like there's a horse's butt right in the, the the front of the painting, and in this case it's like hmm. it's the dog's butt, but it, it, it kind of like you can see how the water brings you up here, you go through here. Look at how there's this intense activity that all happens along this here. You go through here. Back down, you can keep going through it. And this, and this rock brings you back yep. through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very cool. I think this painting, uh, Surrender, also does a really beautiful job with some, in, in some very subtle ways. You know, the way the light is hitting across the grass, you know, and everything is blowing us over to the left, but her gaze is so strong, and the angle of her bike into the foreground on the right just sort of counters that and holds that thing in, in this great mm -hmm. tension. That moves you around. It's it's really brilliantly done. Uh, a story behind this painting. Again, this is another one of my former students, and we started the photo shoot. I'm gonna put that closer to you so I get. I'm not it. drinking. I'm just talking into this microphone that's right here. <laughs> <laughs> so we set up this photo shoot. We get out of the cars. She gets on the bike we take about 10 steps into the field and it's just huge downpour. We get back into our cars. We're totally soaked after just like, just trying to get back to the cars. About 10 minutes later, it stops. We're like, let's go through with the rest of the photo shoot. And one of the main attractions for this painting was that her husband had this old time bike He's a, um, he, he was a BMXer, he still is. He's actually won third in X Games, like on a vert ramp, so it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and so is she. But anyway, he had this collection of old bikes and I wanted to do a painting of the old bike. And she had this beautiful black dress with these like little white rabbit designs and when the sun came back out right after it rained, I took a few photos and it's just her holding the handlebars and there's a rainbow in the background. Like, rainbow is gonna trump anything. That, so like, I needed to get a painting of that. And then her pattern 
dress took me forever to paint and it was like a knockout painting but I didn't really paint the bike at all so I'm like okay round two I want to paint the bike this time but I'm not going to paint that stupid dress I mean the dress is beautiful but like in terms of like oh I'm painting these rabbits and the rabbits are doing like it just drove me crazy so in this case here she's wearing a black dress and the photo shoot was pretty much like this, although there is no white flag of surrender on the back. And then I felt like, like I got the bike, but this whole area is pretty empty. And I was up in Wisconsin with my family and I saw these construction cones tipped over. The sun was just like hitting it so that that orange was just like lightening up. I took the pictures there and then I just, in Photoshop, put them in here, and I was like, this now balances it, and this flag, I, I needed to put the flag there to kind of balance it too. So this was invented, I invented a white flag, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, these in here uh, were all, but I think without that, you don't know exactly what she's looking at, and part of the content of this particular piece is this is an area, it's called Marydale, and we would walk our dog there all the time, and then they, um, the Catholic Church sort of sold it to some private developers, and they said, no trespassing, we still sneak in there from time to time, but it was almost like this forbidden land, and she's kind of like looking off, and she's not probably supposed to go there because of the caution uh, barrels and then there's this white flag almost like she's surrendering to the fact that this is going to eventually be a development which then leads me into some of the other mm -hmm. paintings where there's these um, like clear cuts and figures are in, in those. So. Mm -hmm. You know I, I'm sort of reminded of Andrew Wyatt's Christina's World by this point and you know mm -hmm. in, in a lot of these you know where there's that longing of somebody looking at something uh, yeah. and and this one in particular has that quality mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, it's he's a big influence. And then I mentioned Bo Bartlett earlier. Bo Bartlett was kind of one of his students, did a film with Andrew Wyatt. So um, there's that continuing lineage of narration, I think that's going on. Um, mm -hmm. And those are two guys that are kind of like my heroes. Yeah. You've uh, grouped this show into like five groups. And uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all in terms of how you see the, you know, the three or four that are grouped together, working together, and your thought behind that. Okay. Uh, as you see over on this side here, there's a couple of, like, history-like paintings that's sort of a new thing for me in terms of, like, putting figures into some sort of, like, war action. So I'm kind of playing around with those. I kind of take what I can get. I don't have access to helicopters or, or machine guns. So some of this is like looking on the internet and kind of cut, cutting and pasting and putting these things together. But the helicopter and the two figures in the foreground are from the Smithsonian. And the figures themselves are like this like yellow cast resin sculpture. So I've invented camouflage as well. <laughs> um, but so, I don't know. That, so that's what I'm playing with there. And then there's, uh, as I mentioned, I've been really drawn to landscape for a long time. And when I see some of these forests cut down, it really is hard for me to see that but at the same time I know that I've gotten some really good paintings from it because the landscape itself now is sort of another part of the conflict that the figures have to deal with or the figures are now inhabiting and I'm I'm drawn to that unfortunately I also think that those paintings, along with the paintings up in the front that deal with the war in Ukraine, make one think about like what are you doing 
in terms of these situations that we have going on in the world. And as a painter, I think that I can give these conflicts a voice. I can sort of do what I can to make people alert or to think about what they should do or what they need to think about in terms of what's important. And which also then makes me think, well, I need to, I can't have these bathers right next to these, like this major conflict that's going on in the world that I'm really upset about. So that's why we kind of like put the bathers in this section here, almost to give the really intense drama and uh, int the, the really interest. The, the really intense drama, we need to kind of like give that, we, we need to kind of step back from that a little bit. So I think some of the bathers aren't dealing with as serious of conflict, except maybe this one here called After the Fall. Yeah. But other than that, then the last section might be these uh, children or boys with guns thinking about these uh, rites of passage that maybe all human beings have at some point. Young boys want to prove their manliness or, man, manliness or their masculinity. And I think that that's just an archetypal um, thread that runs through all cultures. All boys want to like, try to prove themselves and um, at the same time, there's bravery as well as fear that can happen. And if you look at this painting here, you look at his stoic look with his toy gun, but his feet betray him with the toes kind of curled, showing his vulnerability. That's a great touch on that painting. I love that. Thanks. It's been pointed out a number of times by people who have come through the show. Uh, talking about um, proving your masculinity and, and doing this, and uh, now I have to talk about skateboarding. All right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I know that skateboarding is a big part of your life, mm -hmm. and uh, I know it's a dangerous part of your life as well. You've been injured a lot doing it. We've talked about that. Uh, I'm sort of curious about how your skateboarding in any way crosses over into your paintings. If there's any any way that something you're learning from that, I mean, you talked about teaching this morning mm -hmm. on the skateboard park, which goes back into your role of a teacher. Mm -hmm. But you know, what if anything is coming mm -hmm. out of that that informs you as yeah. an artist? A few years ago, I told a bunch of people that I was trying to every day. I was trying to scare myself at least once a day, and through that sense of dealing with fear, I might find growth. Sometimes I've had students say, oh, I'm scared to work on this painting. And being a skateboarder has led me to navigate through the world through a sense of like, you gotta go for it here. You, got, you gotta try this. And if you do hurt yourself, like, that's what you should be scared. Like, like, you shouldn't be scared about putting paint on a canvas. You should be scared about falling off your skateboard because <laughs> you can hurt yourself. And so just having that type of mentality, like, most of the time I don't hurt myself when I go skateboarding and I try things that do scare me a little bit and that makes me feel alive. And I think talking about making paintings. I want paintings that deal with a little bit of life. Like I'm not necessarily interested in art for art's sake. I want art to talk a little bit about the really exciting moments of one's life. And tapping into skateboarding, you have to be all in all of the time. You can't be thinking about other things. You have to be all in, and that's a good way to like, um, just kind of keep me focused in that moment. Mm -hmm. 
it's interesting. It's sort of like the whole idea. It's like, yeah, this shouldn't scare you. Put the mark on the canvas. Y yeah, that, that's yeah. not a scary. Yeah. Like, okay, you, just like you might get some paint on your face. Yeah. Um, you, that's you not going to hurt you. Just wipe it off. You yeah. know, yeah. But mm -hmm. that's an interesting uh, sort of a point of perspective about what is what is fair, what is fear, what is scary here, mm -hmm. and that's not it. Yeah. So go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what do you? How do you respond to a, a student when they say that to you? <laughs> oh no. Um, <laughs> so the last time that was said to me, and it might actually be why there's the three paintings out in front about the Ukrainian war. Uh, so I think this happened, well, I guess the war is what, and it's... Just had the second yeah, anniversary. Yeah. Um, it was the day after Russia bombed Ukraine. And a student was like, you know, I'm coming around and they have the white canvas and they're like, I'm so scared of this. And I'm like, think about the people in Ukraine right now. Like, they don't know if they're going to have a house to go to tonight. They don't know if the people that they love are going to be around. Like, that's what, that's scary. This, you can play. It's just a white canvas. You shouldn't be scared. And they're like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. And then they proceeded on and made a nice, interesting uh, painting. And it was like, just trying to figure out, like, what is scary and what isn't scary. Mm -hmm. And almost like, I think a lot of students these days have really like blown out of proportion like anxiety of things that they shouldn't have. I don't know how to deal with that, but putting something in context like I did with the um, paintings that I did out, out there in the front, I think kind of helped navigate that. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that's usually asked is, how do you know when something's finished? Oh, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. it's asked of me, it's asked of other yeah. artists who show here, and uh, you know, you're they all look totally finished, <laughs> and I'm like, mm -hmm. wonder how do you come to that conclusion and just go, okay, moving on. A couple of philosophies that govern my painting. One is a professor that I had. His name is Bill Nichols. And, and in some ways, I think this is a sort of, I'm not saying it's a corrupted quote from um, Chuck Close, who does the very realistic paintings, and then they became uh, somewhat abstract of people's faces. But uh, it's, you have to make every inch of your painting as good as the best inch of your painting. So that's one of my philosophies when I'm making a painting. Hmm. And when I feel that the rest of the painting stands up to a special area, I'm like, okay, I, I, I can be done with it. And I also have a vision of what my painting is supposed to look like before I start it. And maybe some of that's because I'm working from photographs. So not that I'm trying to make my painting look like a photograph, but I already kind of have the general plan of what it's going to look like. In the case... Here, this is the most recent painting in the show, the one called Patrol. I didn't think that it was going to end up as a night painting. Uh, when I started it, I didn't think it was going to even, it was going to be slightly a rainy day, foggy painting. And it's not like that at all. And in that case there, I think it's a, a good painting. And either I'm finished with the painting or the painting is finished. <laughs> like It's just like, I, I need to move on. I can't spend my whole entire life working on one thing. Um, and so in that one, it's I like the surprise because I never thought that it would be this night rainy painting. But at the same time, there's a that's the only painting in this whole entire show. Well, there's one other one that there's a few things that I'm like not totally happy with. But I tried it a few times and I'm like, I think I'm finished with this. It's good enough. Uh, I can't seem to get it as good as I want it. So I'm done with it. <laughs> One other process, process question, because these are 
they're big canvases. There's a lot to manage in terms of color and uh, subject matter, you know, from figurative to background. And do you, how long, when you sit down and do a session, how long do you work? And uh, then do you go, today is water and tomorrow is concrete? You know, mm -hmm. do you break it down that way? Uh, a little bit. Sometimes it depends on how much time I have. Uh, faces, I, I'm, I don't go after a face unless I have at least three hours. And, uh, but like if I only have, or like some days it's going to be, I'm just going to paint grass today. And that's what I'm going to be painting or whatever the case. And I think I'm kind of answering your question right. Uh, sometimes you feel like today is face day. <laughs> like, like you have to have all of your faculties with you and it's like, that's going to be the toughest part because I can make blades of grass any way I want. No one's going to know if that blade of grass was right or not. If the nose isn't in the right place, it's really easy to see that it's wrong. So you have to be all in. And then it also is like, what are you feeling that particular day? This is also like going to the skate parks. When you go to the skate park, some days you're like, I'm going to try this trick no matter what. Some days you're like, mm, maybe I shouldn't try this trick. I'll just do some other things because I'm not totally feeling it. So um, both of those are ways to kind of navigate um, what you're going to do in the studio. Mm -hmm. Does that kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. Do you work with the same palette for every painting? Do you have the same colors? Yeah, color? it's pretty limited. Occasionally, I get really... Um, wow. It, it's pretty limited, and then once in a while, I'll throw in a couple of extra colors, but I use titanium white. I use cadmium yellow light, which is very like a primary yellow. I use cadmium orange, which is like orange. Cadmium red, medium, almost like a straight red. And then cobalt blue, almost a straight blue. Thalo blue, which is a blue that is very dark, but with just a little yellow, it's very close and shifts green. And then um, burnt umber, that's basically my palette almost all the time. Once in a while, if I'm feeling a little dangerous, I'll add some sap green. Crazy. Um, or, uh, well, I also have alizarin crimson for a cool red, which is the color of blood. Um, alizarin crimson is kind of like the bottom part of the blood stain in the in the um, on the bandage there. So, and then once in a while, like I'll throw in some other colors if I, I need them, but okay. I keep it really kind of simple. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna open it up to the floor for other questions from from people in the audience. Yeah. So um, expand on that. So I'm not sure where design and not design are separated when you talk about painting. So because I the way I look at it is that all paintings have design elements. Mm -hmm. So and you can both answer this because you both are clearly versed mm -hmm. in that. You okay. Well, I know we have a professional designer in the um, in in the audience as well. But this is my here here's my take on it. The Italian word for drawing is the same for design, disegno. And so, uh, dating back to the Renaissance, the artist, when they would be drawing whatever they were drawing, they're also thinking about their composition. And so I think about design as composition, which is just as um, vital as the drawing itself. These are realist paintings. And I don't know how many abstract painters there are in the crowd right now. I consider myself a formalist painter. In art terms, a formalist painter deals with the design of the canvas, how you are orchestrating the colors, lines, shapes on that surface. That's one of the reasons why I probably take 300 photos to try to get that one that the composition will work. And even if it doesn't, then I'm throwing in construction barrels or a white flag because I need the composition to really function. Otherwise, I think it's 
I'm spending so much time on these paintings that if I don't do that, people will look at it and they'll quickly like walk away. I think you need to be able to do something better than just painting a pretty face. You have to think about its design on the surface, which allows the viewer to kind of take in the whole entire thing. Does that answer your question? It's a good answer. Okay. I, it's a really good answer. You know, I think about in terms of in architecture, interior design, they talk about way or signage, they talk about wayfinding. And in, in web design, it's user UX, it's user experience. And I think about that in, in looking at it, it's like, what's the experience here? How are you keeping me involved and engaged in the canvas? How are you using line, shape, color, and uh, to move me around and keep me involved and not have me go whoop out the door. So that kind of thought, you know, and what's happening here, I mean, it's things like, you know, where is the horizon line and what does that tell you within cinema? The horizon line, you know, you're down here, you're down here, down here, and all those things have very different connotations in, in setting up the mood and the emotion of that story. And that, that immediate decision is a design decision. You know, the shape of the canvas is a design decision. And then what is your relationship to all those other aspects in the context of that? And then, you know, you layer that with motion, you know, what's happening in this piece mm -hmm. here, you know, the, all the motion's going this way, but her gaze is so strong and going back and the counterbalance of the flag against the white cloud sort of, again, gives this thing this sort of balance, even though it's completely asymmetrical. So those kind of decisions to me are very deliberate, very thought out, and that's what I, that I get involved in. I don't know if anybody else has any. Well, I was going to ask a question about, um, you know, there, these are so narrative and there's, you know, so many stories that come up are about them and I'm a poet, you know, sometimes you write, when I write, you know, I, I don't always know what it's about necessarily at first, but sometimes I write with an intent to write about a certain thing. How, how much do you approach composition with an idea of the story you want it to tell? Or how much is that sort of more of a intuitive or flow kind of thing? I think about it some, and then during the painting process, ideas come to me, and I think about if I need to like accentuate something to make the narrative more, um, m lean more this way or that way, or uh, depending on what I think the overall content is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we could look at this painting here called After the Fall. And I think the one thing that um, when I started this painting, when I did the photo shoot, and I did a couple of, this is a, one of three paintings that are in the series. I was thinking of a painting by Titian, which is in the same room as the Mona Lisa. So if you ever go to the Louvre and you're looking at the Mona Lisa, if you want to see just a incredible painting that floors me every time, walk around the wall and then there's this Titian painting. And it's a deposition scene. They're taking, uh, there's a few people and Christ is actually the opposite way. But when I've seen that painting, I've just like the legs just, it's like there's no life in the Christ. Um, and you see some of the people in the background uh, in agony or like, mm -hmm. like feeling like they're in desperation. Mm -hmm. um, they've just lost their leader. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case here, painting that, uh, when I set this pose, I wanted it to be like the Titian. Mm -hmm. And then in the course of the painting, I didn't know if I wanted her dead or not mm -hmm. and other things started to come forth like the strength of his hand like mm -hmm. is he a hero mm -hmm. or is he looking for someone to help or has he just done something bad to her and he's trying to like cover up evidence or something and then like the spine is just like and the way that that hand dangles and mm -hmm. with the hair all those things like the hair and the hand like gravity, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when I first started the painting, 
gravity had no, like I had no idea that gravity was going to be a part of the painting at all. And now it is. Um, like gravity of just the figure, gravity of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so those are things that kind of like yeah. happen in the studio uh, as you're, like you have the idea and then yeah. you're kind of like it, wiggling. It kind of moves with the, or mm -hmm. maybe pulls you along sometimes like a story will mm -hmm. do that. Like a story. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was going to mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. yeah. And your titles, do you come up with them afterwards or do you have them in mind at the beginning or is it a mixture? It's a total mixture. Sometimes I use, um, uh, well, after the fall, I mean, yeah. it, it's, like it's a good one and it's been used before um and then other ones in this series um there's uh different musical songs that i've used so sometimes uh or the there's a painting of the ferris wheel and the girl holding uh, that one is called joyland and i would listen to a lot of audiobooks while I paint and there's this one called Joyland by Stephen King of this like amusement park that's kind of deadly and things and then um, State of the Nation is a song from New Order mm -hmm. and I did that painting right after um, President number 45 was elected and so um, maybe he should make that Ferris wheel great again. <laughs> like, um, like the the blue and the red and the white paint, everything seems like, like, mm -hmm. and, and then she's not happy. And um, so, I think my batting average is really high, but I think it's also it, maybe all of that preliminary stuff lets it be that high. Um, because I don't necessarily find any surprises. Like, I don't know how to deal with this. Uh, and that's another thing that I sometimes tell my students. I'll have, and it's something that I think I will have this question all the time. Like, they're like, I don't know how to paint X. Like, I don't know how to paint fabric. I don't know how to paint the skull. I don't know how to paint bones. I don't know how to paint metal. And the way that I try to teach them to paint and the way that I paint myself is that it's very similar to what, how Claude Monet describes his painting technique. Like you put a oblong of pink here, a little bit of blue shape here, a square of uh, orange there, whatever. And then you step back and it's there. And so there's still tons of things I don't know how to paint or I've never painted, but I don't even have to worry about that. It's like, oh, if I just paint this stroke, paint that stroke, paint this stroke, I step back and that's kind of where I get the surprise. Like, oh my goodness, I painted, you know, whatever. So that, that's where some of the exciting things happen for me and uh, in, in terms of the studio. But most of the time, and I don't know if it's because I think of myself as a photographer that paints or as a, um, a filmmaker that can't make a film, but it's like I see the scene and then like that's it. Now it's just about the execution. Does that answer your question, Michael? Absolutely, yeah. All right, thanks. Well, you, go ahead, Jerry. Um, your, your fish drawings that you did at the, at the fish place, did you see those? No, like no, they were they were they were like I, nobody cared about those things except me. Um, uh, but like, uh, it, um, like my wife Tammy, she was with me in this whole endeavor with the fish, and so I'd be like, does this I, the fish were probably horribly drawn too. I mean, they weren't, but it was like it was just kind of like you shouldn't put this fish with other types of this species because they're not going to get along and so it was just kind of like information for well, the drawings were horrible but it was <laughs> like it was just like I don't know it was me, me just trying to like show interest and enthusiasm with what I was doing and but you're drawing from a real model where you know the fish the fish wasn't dead when you were drawing no no <laughs> we were a good fish store. We weren't selling dead fish, but um, but um, we weren't that kind of they, they, they were basically. I was just drawing from like these um, 
almost like these the atlas of um, fish. Um, like this is where the and then the th this fish its habitat is South America. It should be um, likes to eat other fish or is a vegetarian. Like things that people should know when they're selling the fish so that um, we wouldn't have complaints from our customers. Another question I have regarding this painting yeah. here. And you mentioned Bo Bartlett. I had, I had looked at a book, as a matter of fact, that a friend gave me a book of Bo Bartlett stuff. I had never seen it before. And the painting that reminds me so much of this is the one that's called Hiroshima. I don't know if you're familiar with that. The two women standing. You can see the light coming to them and knowing what's happening. This is kind of a similar one with the flag and looking out like she's looking at something that has mm -hmm. happened or is about to happen. I mean, it's incredible. Interlinked, they seem to be mm -hmm. to me anyway, mm -hmm. which, which is good. One further question: You talk about storyboarding. Have you ever considered doing kind of a series of painting, like a triptych of several in a row that are that are telling more of the story, mm -hmm. or in some manner? Yeah, this one is part of a a, a, a kind of a triptych. So this there's yeah, there's one big one that's more um, uh, panoramic, and then this one and another one are more. Um, vertical not that it's supposed like I've shown them that way a couple of times for the whole series um, and then I've just kind of sort of pick and chose which ones the Hiroshima painting <laughs> and Jerry I, he's a friend of mine we did not have this discussion earlier the painting that's on my easel right now that I'm working on is called Hiroshima <laughs> and it's because this Bo Bartlett painting uh, I, uh, Hiroshima, I've been thinking about, and um, I was in Vancouver last summer. There was a Asian festival. I saw this little girl in a kimono. I took some pictures of her that day, and I was like, man, with one bomb drop, thousands of voices were silenced. Then I find out, I took the picture on the anniversary of Hiroshima. And at the same time, we have a summer with um, the movie Oppenheimer. And to think about how, uh, and I don't know if we need to go into like, um, if there needed to be a bomb dropped or not, um, but the fact that American scientists were able to tap into the very sort of like elements to make something that was so destructive. Um, but at the same time, if you watch that movie, they all want to see what's going to happen. And the painting that I'm doing right now um, is almost about time itself in that there's this light that's happening. You don't see the mushroom cloud. The girl is looking and her dog just wants to be pet. The dog's like, kind of like, hey, pet me. And the village is underneath her. And we don't know if she's going to be okay or not because this is happening far away. There's the plane kind of in the distance that's going out of frame. And even the way that I've painted the sky um, it looks like the air and the rays from the blast explosion are like started, they're almost here. So we're talking like milliseconds. And like as a painter, your image is still, it's frozen forever. In a movie, and most movies have narratives to them, you get one sequence, one sequence, one sequence to tell a story. And so I'm trying to um, almost like reverse engineer that by saying I'm freezing time as opposed to showing you time going forward. That's a, I can't wait to see the painting. I think you showed me a sketch of this. Yeah. And we just get to like, the last I didn't, question. Like the sketch is the sketch is pretty beautiful. I didn't bring it because I didn't necessarily want to like talk about Hiroshima today. But yeah. That, we're, well, it, yeah, but so my final question is you've talked about Photoshop a number of times, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're using cameras, you're using Photoshop, you're using technology, mm -hmm. you're using Kinko, you know, you're mm -hmm. doing, you're deploying a lot of different technologies mm -hmm. to make your paintings happening. What about AI? 
is that entering mm -hmm. into your, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your iterative mm -hmm. processes, you know, in the preliminary thing, yeah. preliminary uh, work. The last two paintings, I have used AI. Um, in this one here, the Korean painting, you see that dark tree form that's behind the guy that's kind of leaning over. Mm -hmm. Like I typed in like foggy Korean jungle and it came up with some images and then I kind of changed that a little bit. And so like there are parts I'm like, oh, I like that tree, I'm gonna use that. And then in, with Hiroshima, I've asked people um, that have been to Hiroshima and have taken pictures of the the monument the, the peace monument but like that's after the fact and then i've watched movies of um hiroshima the city before it was blown up and the point of view is like i'm in a very wooden town uh, i'm on the streets watching people on the bicycles and things like that but i wanted something from further away so i had my composition with my landscape and my figure, and then I typed in like Japanese dogs. Oh, okay, that, I look at a bunch of dogs. I like that one. I'm gonna put that one into my painting. Then I needed a city or a town or a village, and I needed like a view looking down into the valley. So I typed in like um, Japanese village Bird's eye, view. bird's eye view and I get some eh, eh, eh. and like some of them I think the they're from like maybe the like the the, the, the buildings are white they're not they, they don't look like they're old so my wife and I in Photoshop then start to making make them look old and rugged and and so I have been using it okay. uh, on the pa past two paintings cool yeah I love that <laughs> mm -hmm. I want to thank you guys all for coming. I really appreciate you. you guys coming and spending some time here um, and hearing me just jab away. I hope it was worth it. Thank you so Before much. Before you all disperse.